when Preservation Dallas first started in 1972, there really wasn't a, a big preservation, there wasn't a preservation epic here in Dallas. So Preservation Dallas, or at that time, the Historic Preservation League really had to build that ethic within the city. And it took the original founders of the organization who worked so hard to save Swiss Avenue and were successful in that, to take that effort to create Preservation Dallas, or at the time, Historic Preservation League, and then to use that organization as a, as a way to expand the importance of preservation in the city. And they did a lot of very, very innovative programs early on with publications, doing a revolving loan fund, and really working to identify neighborhoods as important, which was huge. City Council, City Plan Commission, Landmark Commission. So all those commission members and city council members now know us and know the organization. When we are coming to City Hall to advocate for something that is important and that we are really trying to make sure that we are saving these incredible places of Dallas for the future because you know once they're gone, they're gone forever. The founders of the Historic Preservation League, the precursor to Preservation Dallas, all lived in what was to become the Swiss Avenue Historic District. We talked about a name for the organization and, and mulled over several things, but the important thing was that in naming it, it be something that would be inclusive of the entire city. So. Our, our interest was not to let it be a local East Dallas thing, but to let it be something for all of Dallas, thus Historic Preservation League. But there was very little interest in historic preservation of structures in Dallas. The concept of preserving was uh, really not something that was talked about. When we went to the city council, they laughed at us. They, they all laughed at us, literally, and said, what do you mean preservation? Those, those houses are going to be torn down and we're going to build high rises there. We came back to my living room after that meeting with the city council. We were bummed out. We were really depressed because we had been laughed at. We did not like being laughed at. And we said, well, I guess you just can't fight City Hall. And somebody else said, then we'll just become City Hall. And that is precisely what we set about to do. It was the beginning of my political career, and we learned the importance of politics. The organization was a historically volunteer organization, and they wanted to get some help and shift to an organization that had a staff, and a good place to start was an executive director. The board was engaged in working with the executive director on a minimal basis, really, it was mostly Dorothy Savage and Virginia McAllister and Lee McAllister at that time. The Historic Preservation League office, as I recall, seemed to be in a garage. And I seemed to be in the garage. This library is awfully impressive compared to that garage. <laughs> Look at the library, Mom. Thank you all so much for coming today for this wonderful occasion where we get to rededicate this amazing room to a person that we all love and respect for her tremendous contributions to preservation, not only here in Dallas, but across, across the whole country. I had many, many meetings around this table here. This table is from uh, Virginia's dining room. Uh, and I know the family has lots of stories of all the, the things that were planned around this table. We would really not be in this space if it wasn't for Virginia. Originally, we were the Historic Preservation League at that time, and we were down in the Arnold House at the end of this block. Virginia had a vision for this building. She wanted it to be a center where people could come and learn about the historic neighborhoods, about preservation, 
where they could come and study and learn. And this library that we're in was also Virginia's idea. And so we are officially renaming this room the Virginia Savage McAllister Preservation Library. Yeah, thank you. Historic Preservation League, I think as a phrase, has some very traditional connotations. The board and the staff of HPL realized that it needed to to move into its next phase. I think it was more embracing than Historic Preservation League. It made sense to people in Dallas to put the name Dallas in it instead of limit it to just historic preservation. And I remember there was a little pride in ownership and some of our feelings got a little bit hurt because we were gonna change the name. But then when we looked at it as what was really better for preservation in Dallas, clearly having the name Dallas in it was the better thing. And I don't think we had much angst about it. I don't, I don't, remember, I, I don't remember crying about that. <laughs> we had this excellent space, uh, a two-story space with public rooms downstairs and then offices upstairs. And so the challenge was, what are we gonna do with the downstairs space? And that's where the concept of the in-town living center arose. A map, neighborhood newsletters, information about the history of the neighborhood, photographs of representative houses. All of that neighborhood information was gathered together and with the help of the late Rick Bertel, we created this in-town living center that had touchscreen computers, which at the time were very innovative, where you could, you know, uh, look at a different part of town, touch on a neighborhood's name, and find out all of that information. We got together uh, people who were experts on the different neighborhoods, and we created a two-day course that told realtors about the neighborhoods, but also gave them a little basic information about architectural styles so they could talk about that. And that historic house specialist seminar became a, a national model. In 2014, we had some unfortunate demolitions in downtown Dallas four buildings that were on the National Register of Historic Places were unceremoniously demolished on a Sunday without any public notice. And it really caught the public's attention about why could this happen. So we immediately uh, responded to media inquiries about what was going on, how this could happen, because at that time there were no protections for those historic buildings uh, in, in downtown Dallas. We held a public information session to talk to people about what was going on and what kind of protections there could be, why these buildings came down. It was really a way to kind of galvanize the public around this issue. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Catherine Seal, my predecessor, uh, worked to get a task force established at the city of Dallas. That task force worked for six months and they came up with nine recommendations. And one of the primary recommendations was to develop a demolition delay overlay uh, for downtown Dallas. We were able to get that passed in 2015 and it was even expanded in 2018. One of the other goals of the recommendation was to resurvey downtown Dallas. In 2020, we were able to get funding for the survey project, which enabled the city to contract with a consultant out of Austin to survey all of downtown, and we were actually able to include Deep Ellum as part of that. Some of my favorite programs or events at Preservation Dallas are really our tours. I love all of our in-town outings that we do to be able to get people behind the scenes and to maybe see a building before it's rehabilitated or during its rehabilitation. One of our recent uh, in-town outings was to the uh, Lacey House on Tokalon over in the Lakewood area. Welcome everyone. 
The house is a French eclectic style. We think it was built around uh, 1930. It was designed by architect Vern Shanklin. Um, and we believe that Lacey probably built it being in the construction business. He could do a mosaic with all sort of leftover marble. These could be from downtown buildings or who knows. Oh, that's right. I mean, he, he's in construction, yeah. Lacey was. Yeah. So the deal to purchase the house from the Lacey's was done with a handshake to the Steinbecks, which is quite incredible. And it was also requested that the Steinbecks not paint over the green wash and the plaster filigrees, which you will see inside the house. I am a huge fan of Preservation Dallas. It's important, I think, for everybody to see homes like this in its original, like really original state. I mean, we have a time capsule bathroom right there behind us that I'm amazed that no one's touched it. In a city like Dallas, where people think the easiest path is to push something over, I argue it, that it doesn't have to be that way. And it actually, from a time value standpoint, um, an older home that's been renovated or added onto is actually going to be, uh, over time, more financially viable. Dallas is always about the new, the new, the new, and uh, we don't really have any respect for old properties, I don't think. Preservation Dallas facilitates an awareness of the history of the city. I don't like tearing down things just because they're old. I've always believed that you can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. Preservation Dallas does a wonderful job of calling attention to those places and marshalling public opinion to try to save some of these places. I think that's extraordinarily important. I think about it now as uh, Preservation Dallas was kind of small. I think we had a relatively small staff. Uh, there were some pretty strong advances that they had been doing over the last few years, particularly in the political part of working with city council and working with some of the neighborhoods. So there was a really strong foundation and some pretty strong preservation programs uh, that we just continued to build on after I was there. We had strong city council support. Valletta Lill was on council at the time. We became interested in the Stadler Hilton and I kind of learned about its uh, fate. It had been sitting there idle for a few years and we had been circling around the mid-century modern architecture uh, issues and buildings and sites in Dallas. But it seemed like everybody was avoiding the Stadler Hilton uh, and not really sort of taking it seriously even though it was in a particularly a uh, great spot to be redeveloped. To me, that was probably one of the most important mid-century buildings in Dallas. I'm glad it finally got there. One of the most life-changing uh, events for me and for Preservation Dallas at the time was Baldwin House on the uh, Swiss Avenue Historic District. The call came and it was like, there's a bulldozer coming down the street. It's coming toward this house. Virginia and I believe had had a discussion beforehand about these owners who had purchased it who said they were going to rehabilitate it and uh, then clearly had different intentions. So all of it became very obvious on that Saturday morning. And one of the first people I called was Valletta who said, I'll put on my makeup and I'll be right there. Very honestly, looking back, I had no idea what we were doing other than we had a mission to stop the bulldozer and to save the house. It would have been the first demolition within Swiss Avenue Historic District. So it seemed like a pretty clear line in the sand for Preservation Dallas and for the neighborhood uh, to stop that demolition. We found this uh, judge and I explained to him what was going on and he said, sure, I'll sign that. And it was done, and so we ran back with the restraining order uh, to stop the demolition. And Preservation Dallas really took the lead on this. But you know, we stepped forward, we did what, what we said people should do, and we saved a house that was imminently under threat for demolition. It would have been gone, I mean, within an hour or so, I'm sure. Preservation Dallas had had a long interest in the 10th Street neighborhood. Uh, the one house that we did work on to stabilize the house and to make it livable again was an effort to do something in a demonstrative way rather than just in an advocacy verbal way. When I came to Preservation Dallas in 2001, one of the things that they had already been talking about 
<clears throat> was an effort to uh, update the survey of Dallas. There were some gaps in, in neighborhoods and geography, and there were some gaps uh, certainly in uh, periods of architecture as being significant. So they wanted to do something like this. I think we came up with the name Discover Dallas. I had Catherine to do the work. I was hired to coordinate and direct Discover Dallas, which uh, was a very ambitious project to serve survey all of the historic neighborhoods in the city of Dallas, and then to put all of that information into a, a searchable online database. The idea was that we were going to document the entire city. I mean, it was just such an ambitious undertaking. There was no budget. There was no blueprint. I mean, it was like day one, like here's a notebook and a pen, you know, go figure it out. So we created a lot of historic districts and conservation districts, National Register nomination. Dwayne accepted his job at the Galveston Historical Foundation and the board asked me to serve as the interim executive director, which I was thrilled to do, and that was in 2007. And we put together an extensive search to find an executive director and we made an offer maybe six, eight months later. Um, to a, a rising preservationist who in the end really wanted nothing to do with Dallas, Texas. And so I think they were all just so tired of searching. They turned to me and said, oh, Catherine, we're so tired of this executive director search. You've been doing it for a year. Would you like to do it? So, you know, anyway, of course I was so honored to be thought of in that way, but no, I was um, happy to do it. Of course I jumped at the opportunity and um, that's how I became the executive director. One of my favorite things about working at Preservation Dallas was the incredible board that I had the honor to work with. We had a lot of board members who had all kinds of a variety of different um, backgrounds that they could bring to the organization, and it just brought a lot of gravitas. I was really fortunate to be a part of all of that. We're losing stuff that we know is out there, but we've never had it surveyed or formally identified. You know, we have a big city with thousands and thousands of potentially historic buildings, and we, our, our, our resource surveys were focused on certain neighborhoods. Most of those were done in the late 1980s. We, we surveyed downtown about five times since then. Now we're getting an, a nice one on Deep Ellum too. It's always been great to have the support of board members. They really are, engaged, they want to help. Our board members really are deeply committed to the cause, to making sure that we succeed, because you know, as an organization of only three, we can only do so much. And by having those board members, it really adds to what we can do as an organization. I've never been to the Disney streets, and I'm not quite sure what we're talking about there. Um, but I'm pretty sure I may know a little pocket off somewhere in Old Cliff that is strange and unknown to anybody. So, I mean, in my mind, I would start with just one, a map would help me. So just like you said, we can get people to tell us where the neighborhoods are and, and why they think they're important. I That's think the neighborhood program that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. we expanded out because those are like post-World War II neighborhoods that cool. carry some value, like the Disney streets, and we add that. I can think of a bunch of different ways we could use that information and use to tell stories and use to talk to people and use to convince council members that they've got important stuff in their neighborhood. So advocacy is essential. I agree that we've got to advocate for today, but to, to be effective with that advocacy, I still believe strongly that we've got to educate. This, this is an ongoing problem. But the reason I am an advocate is due to education. You can't learn how we got here unless you know your history. That's why we were founded. I mean, we were founded by a group in Swiss Avenue that worked really hard to save their neighborhood and they felt we needed to have an organization that could do that for the entire city and could be advocates for, for all of the historic places in the city. And so that's, that's how we were started and I think that's you know, how we are continuing to, on to this day. We had just been given an amazing opportunity by the Meadows Foundation who gave us a three-year grant to, to reinvent ourselves, really. We had moved over to the Wilson House 
um, after Meadows Foundation completed their new building across the street. So we had this great opportunity and we began to explore possibilities for where HPL would go in the future. A lot of things had to happen for us to be successful in creating an historic district. You couldn't get money to buy houses on Swiss Avenue, uh, so we needed banking help. We needed to look like we knew what we were doing. All of us were very naive, uh, except for Dorothy and Wallace Savage, and they knew exactly what they were doing and exactly what needed to be done. The late Mike Brown had devised for us a uh, pamphlet that we sent out every Sunday that there wasn't a cowboy game. The problem was the people who lived in the district were lobbied extensively by the Crown Riches and others who, who had bought those houses with good reason. They had invested money in them and we were about to blow them out of the water. One of the threats was, if this becomes an historic district, there'll be tour buses up and down your street all the time. And we said, oh, no, no, that won't help. And every time there's a tour bus, I feel very guilty because I really, but I, we really thought we were telling the truth. <laughs> In one year's time, we went from having uh, no votes to everyone laughing at us to being so unanimous that the city council walked all over each other to be sure they gave us the support. So that's why we made such things as buying a house in Old East Dallas. People weren't buying houses in Old East Dallas to live in. Uh, they were buying houses on Swiss Avenue to tear down and make into high-rises. Such books as A Guide to Older Neighborhoods of Dallas had as its goal to change people's thinking about living in older homes. The desirable thing to do was a push-button home in far north Dallas, which was then far. Now it's near north Dallas, but, but the push-button convenience of switch a button and you have air conditioning. You didn't have that in older neighborhoods. So somehow we needed to make older neighborhoods look attractive because none of this would work unless it worked economically. Today at Preservation Dallas, we are doing a workshop on how to repair historic windows. It's a very hands-on workshop. People get to actually take apart windows and learn how to repair sashes, uh, repair the sash weight, uh, how to replace glass, glazed windows. People who love historic preservation are very crazy about keeping their historic windows because they're such an important feature of our historic buildings and really help tell the story of the building, they tell the style of the building. They just really give the building a character you can't get with these new window replacements. So is this your putty work or is this your putty work? Okay. Yeah. So you did a great job. Today we have Ron Siebler and his crew helping us. Ron is a preservation contractor and also board member of Preservation Dallas. I have been wanting to replace my windows for probably 10 years. And every time I started to think about it, and deal with the city, it became overwhelming, and I just didn't have enough education, and I got frustrated, and so I just put it on the back burner. Nobody lowers their windows anymore. That they no matter if you're gonna do the work yourself or if you're gonna hire somebody to do it, you'll know if they're doing it right. Preservation Dallas is such a great asset to the city because it's a repository of information, of history, of education, of resources. It's like one-stop shopping. You go there and it doesn't matter what question you have, they're either gonna know the answer or they're gonna get you the answer because they do workshops like this and they bring awareness to what we might lose. We would not be the city we are without Preservation Palace. I think I can confidently say that. I'd say I'm the accidental preservationist in the sense that I thought everybody 
believed in the saving of old buildings in beautiful architecture. I thought that was what you were born with. I learned fairly quickly that was not the case. I first became involved with Preservation Dallas when I started running for office. And a friend of mine said, do you know Catherine Horsey? I said, you need to know Catherine. So I immediately came down and met with Catherine and we bonded over, obviously, preservation. I was elected fairly soon after the Dr. Pepper controversy. I came on the council in 1997. There are a number of turning points in preservation in Dallas. The demolition of the Dr. Pepper building being one of them. Dallas city leaders have often been accused of not caring much about history. Many old landmarks have faced the wrecking ball, and the few old buildings left continue to be threatened. Channel 8's Dave Evans explains. Two years ago, the demolition of a bit of Dallas history, the Dr. Pepper building on Mockingbird, shocked a lot of people. They asked, how could this happen to such a landmark designated so by City Hall? People in Dallas think that if a building is designated, that it's protected, and that's not the case here. If you have a designated building and you apply for a demolition permit, all you have to do in Dallas is wait 240 days, and you can tear it down, no questions asked. And that's not protection. Catherine Horsey would like to see some tougher protection rules on the books. In Dallas, landmark rules are weak and favor the property owner, regardless of how historic the building might be. Dallas continues to lose history like this. But the fact of the matter is, in Dallas, it is harder to change the paint color on the house than it is to demolish a building. Dave Evans, Channel 8 News. At the time of the demolition of the Dr. Pepper building, there was a clause, if you will, in the preservation ordinance that allowed for a delay. But it did not stop the demolition of the building. And that was an important point going forward in changing the ordinance, to find ways to make it more difficult to take down buildings. The preservation of St. Anne's School, part of the preservation ordinance that protected that building and defined what it was gonna look like going forward, also stopped it from being demolished and it put it commemorated it into that ordinance and that was the beginning of not only will it be you cannot tear down the building without going through a very long sequence of events we took that from the saint anne's ordinance and moved it into a citywide ordinance for landmarks we went through a series of events in which the desire to demolish buildings came one after another. So we had only completed saving St. Anne's when we got into the next battle, which was Crozier Tech, Old Dallas High School. I'm Gloria Munoz. I went to high school here. When I came here, it was in our Crozier Technical High School. It was originally called the Dallas High School. In that case, in order to designate a building over the property owner's objections, it requires a three quarters vote of the council which is a very, very rigorous standard to protect the building. We were able to protect Old Ellis High School, and then following the adoption of the ordinance, the property owner tested all the segments of the ordinance to try to demolish and failed. The reason people at City Hall take preservation more seriously now is not only for the battles that we have fought, but we, through those battles, we adopted a preservation ethic. And so 
many people across the community, they articulated why preservation was important to them. And that was across the council. It's not for a specific segment of town or a segment of the population or a few individuals. Preservation now is seen as an important ethic for a community. One of the best things that Preservation Dallas does, or at least the most fun thing that Preservation Dallas does, is our holiday parties. There's something really special about a Victorian house decorated during the Christmas holiday season. Everyone's dressed up, the doors are open, the porch is full, the drinks are flowing, and it's just a really great community building event. You get to visit with people that you haven't seen in a long time, and everyone is talking about their love of architecture, their love of the city. It's a heartwarming kind of thing. I don't know what the winner. Right. That's a red. A red. All right. Thank you. Thank you. gold snowflake. <laughs> I think now maybe maybe more than ever people recognize the importance of advocating for historic buildings because we're losing them at such a quick clip. And I think as land values continue to rise, you're gonna see more and more pressure on our older neighborhoods. So I think that it's now a more prevalent topic than it was when I first started working here. I think the future is bright for preservation. City Hall hears us more. People who live here see the importance of their history. One thing I would caution people about is don't take things for granted. It's, it's a constant discussion that you need to have about preserving your city. So the future is bright as long as we keep having the conversation. I think the challenge of the future will be now that we have um, rising land values, how you come up with a uh, prescriptive as opposed to proscriptive approach to preservation and how we unleash the value of these historic assets. It's a totally different way of thinking about historic buildings. You know, I think the future of preservation is really, we're gonna have to get very creative about how the tools that we come up with and how we think about it. And I think that's really actually very exciting. Preservation is a slow game. It's not something fast and, you know, when we work to try and save a building, sometimes it can take years or decades before the building can find the right owner, the right developer to make the project work. We've had over 1.5 billion, that's with a B, of investment in historic tax credit projects in Dallas. Look at what that's created as far as jobs, as far as putting buildings back on the tax rolls at higher assessed values, providing new places for people to live, providing new restaurants, new retail. I mean, if you look at all of the historic buildings we have, we have very few now that are vacant, whereas that was not the case 10 years ago. So we've seen an incredible shift in how preservation has helped to help really to revitalize and improve the vibrancy of downtown Dallas with all of these great projects that have come online and really unique projects and unique places for people to live, shop, and work. You can't make houses like the houses in the Swiss Avenue Historic District or on South Boulevard or in Winnetka. You can't make houses like that anymore. There are not craftspersons who are capable of doing that kind of work. 
I'm very positive about the future of historic preservation here. And quite frankly, much of it is because of Preservation Dallas and what you do. You have made us realize that preservation is a very important part of our culture. And I believe many, many people now know that.